So glad to see so many of you here and some new faces, which is great. Uh, this is the third part of our friend David's presentation. Uh, and it has been wonderful, <laughs> absolutely oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I'm conscious of the time, and I want to get as much <laughs> of David in as possible. So my friend, take it away. Say, Doc, right. we have some new people here. Could, maybe we should do a, a oh, oh. Uh, uh, maybe we should spill our coffee and make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. Nice job. Never mind. <laughs> That's a good idea. You can call me clumsy. <laughs> David, before you pray, we we'll start with, with Pat Armour. Sarah Caldero. Uh, Nelson Rivera. Janice Rhyme. Stephen Brown. Chris Chandler. Emily Jeske. Cindy Simpson. Carol Overbold. Bill Irwin. Paul Beck. Virginia Florio. Elizabeth Pezkowski. <laughs> and Diane <Dottie> Dong. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see you again. I see we have more people on uh, on Zoom. So, and their names are all displayed for us to see, so they can't hide. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great to be with you today, and I just want to say it's always interesting. Um, when my good friend Dottie walks in the room, suddenly the room gets louder. <laughs> and, and it's not, it's because she starts greeting everybody. And so it's wonderful to hear. I know that things are getting ready to go when Dottie comes in. <laughs> well, I was just walking two other rooms out there, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so this is the third of a, a three-part session. If you haven't been involved in the other two, I, I don't think you'll you'll be any worse for the wear. Um, I'll do a little bit of review of the other two sessions, but we'll dive right in to this one. So let us begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Good and gracious God, you have gifted to us yet another day, another gathering day, which we might come together around your word and sacrament as a community and in which we might gather together here in this place to think and ponder about Jesus, who Jesus is for us and who he is for many people throughout this world. We ask that you open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so um, this morning we will be looking at three different stories that come from the Islamic traditions about Jesus and his role in performing miracles. Now, in the first session, three weeks ago, we looked at the passages about Jesus in the Quran, and there are a small number of them in the Quran, even though Jesus might be named. And we remember that the Quran came to be, or at least was compiled, in about 650 A.D., or CE, so in the seventh century. And then last week, we began looking at some of the hadith or sayings that were um, attributed to Muhammad or his companions about Jesus. So not in the Quran or not scripture, but traditions about Jesus that focused on describing him as a prophet and who he was. These particular traditions were collected and compiled about the 7th and 8th century, so anywhere from 80 to 150 years after the Quran was compiled. Now today, we get not, um, not scripture about Jesus, or even discussions about his sayings or what he looked like, but actual narrative about his um, producing miracles. Now, if any of you have done in-depth study on the Gospels, and I know that many of you have, what is, the gen what is the general rule of thumb when it comes to any particular um, passage about Jesus that is recorded in the Gospels, all four Gospels, 
the shorter saying or reference, let's say there's a short reference about Jesus, and it's, again, um, in another gospel, but there's a longer version of that or a much more detailed version of that. What is the general rule of thumb in terms of the dating we think of those gospels and when they were written? Does that make sense? Yeah, shorter is earlier. Say that again? Shorter is earlier. <laughs> shorter is earlier, right. So the shorter the, the saying by Jesus or the shorter the description, and if it's reflected in the other gospels and it's longer, more detailed, most, most scholars think, most New Testament scholars believe that the later one is an extrapolation filling in some of the information that was not present in the earlier one, or at least from a different perspective. We can definitely say that with the, in this case, where we find these extensive narratives about Jesus and what he does. And I want you to keep in mind, not Bible passages or um, biblical literature, but as we read through these three passages, I'd like you to think of what other kinds of literature you might be aware of that these stories sound like? Where do they resonate with you in perhaps other literature that you have read or come across? I just want you to keep that in the in the back in your back back of your mind as we go through this. So I think what would be best is that the stories are taken up into uh, paragraphs, and I think it would be good for each of us to start, just read a paragraph, and then we'll go around, if that's okay. Um, you all have the handout in front of you? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I can, uh, I, I wrote down some names because I can't see all of them in the picture, but Virginia? Yes. Yep. Okay. Would you mind starting the first paragraph and then Paul would be next and then Bill? You mean the one starting with a man once accompanied? Yes. Okay. And as I always do, just as I did now, I will interrupt you. <laughs> because when we get to a particular point, I may say, oh, let's stop and look at this. Okay. All right. <laughs> Once accompanying Jesus, saying to him, I want to be with you and be your companion. They set forth and reached the bank of a river where they sat down to eat. They had with them three loaves. They ate two loaves, and the third remained. Jesus then rose and went to the river to drink. When he returned, he did not find the third loaf. So he asked the man, who took the loaf? I do not know, the man replied. Okay. All right, so we're setting the scene here. And as uh, we talked about last week, as Jesus, as this wandering preacher and teacher, and some of you mentioned, oh, that's different than what I'm used to, that he had all kinds of disciples around him. Well, here's a case in which this wandering preacher and teacher um, began to collect disciples who asked to follow him. And this is common in the ancient Near East, especially with monastics, with monks or ascetics who came to be known very popular in their wisdom. People wanted to follow them around and be their students. So here in this case, we find that Jesus um, has become so popular that there's a, a, a disciple who wants to follow him and, and mimic what he's doing. But in this case, it seems like the person may not even have passed the first bar of candidacy for ministry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, next paragraph, Paul. Get this. Jesus set forth once more with the man, and he saw a doe with two of her young. Jesus called one of the two, and it came to him. Jesus then slaughtered it, roasted some, some of it, and ate with his companion. Then he said to the young deer, Rise by God's leave. The deer rose and left. Jesus then turned to his companion and said, I ask you in the name of him who showed you this miracle, who took the loaf? I don't know the man replied. <laughs> okay. And if you know. Test number two. All right. So um, what happens here with the dough? What does Jesus do? Uh, she kills it. She kills it and then raises it up again. Okay. So 
And if you <laughs> right, why why would he do that? He becomes a part of him. Oh. He has power over life and death. He has power over life and death. Right. He can he can as Isaiah says, I create weal and make woe. I you know, um, I have life and death. So here. Jesus is demonstrating his power over the life and death of this particular animal. Um, and there have been some recent um, Muslim commentators who have uh, talked in terms of the environmentalism and how important some Islamic traditions are regarding environmentalism here. So you don't necessarily kill the deer, right? You can kill it and eat it, but then you raise it back up and it goes. And so it's kind of like catch and release, I guess. I don't know. Um, but notice, how does he raise the deer? How does he do that? By command. By he said to the young deer, rise. By God's. By God's leave, right? By God's leave. So he doesn't say, I, I command you to rise. He says, by God's leave. So Remember that. Keep that in the back of your, your mind. Okay, next paragraph. Then they came to a waterless desert and sat down upon the ground. Jesus began to gather some earth and sand and then said, Turn to gold by God's leave. And it did so. Jesus divided the gold mm. into three portions and said, A third for me, a third for you, and a third for whoever took the loan. <laughs> The man said, it was I who took the loaf. Jesus says, the gold is all yours. Aha. Okay. So the third test and the, the disciple fails miserably. We, we might imagine, huh? depending on your perspective, I guess. <laughs> okay. All right. Again, notice, turn to gold by God's leave. By God's leave. We'll come back to that. All right. Next paragraph. Jesus then left him. Two men came upon him in the desert with the gold and wanted to rob and kill him. He said to them, let us divide it into three portions among us and send one of you to town to buy us some food to eat. One of them was sent off and then said to himself, why should I divide the gold with those two? Rather, I shall poison the food and have the gold to myself. He went off and did so. Oh my gosh. Jeez. Okay, so Jesus leaves, he's out of the picture. And then this disciple who has the gold heads off into the desert, and he's overcome by two, two men, maybe thieves, who knows. And uh, then one of them begins to plot about how he can get all the, all the gold. All right, last paragraph. Meanwhile, the two who stayed behind said to each other, why should we give him a third of the gold? Instead, let us kill him, and when he returns, and divide the money between the two of us. When he returned, they killed him, ate the food, and died. <laughs> <laughs> the gold remained in the desert with the three men dead beside it. Jesus passed by, found them in that condition, and said to his companions, this is the world. Beware of it. Ooh. Okay. This sounds like a scene in Fargo or something, you know? I mean, that's a good analogy. <laughs> Favorite movies. Okay. So, so, what is the point of this particular story here? What do you think is the point? Uh, David, I, I'm not sure what the point means, but it reminds me of the parable by Jesus, you know, about the man who built these warehouses, put a lot of grain there, and then said, I have enough for the rest of my life, and he's like, idiot, you're going to die tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who's going to inherit all of that? So it sounds like, <coughs> now, uh, whose goal is it? <laughs> right. Nobody gets enough. Nobody gets enough. And somebody else will come across it at some point. Maybe the whole story will start over again, right? <laughs> so I guess uh, thinking of the parable is that, you know, uh, where is your focus? You know, are, you know, on riches or wealth or, or what? Or mm -hmm. something similar, I guess, to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
I guess I also thought of you can't get away with things like this with God. <laughs> oh. For without God, there is nothing. Yeah, you can't fool God, huh? No, no. <laughs> I think right. if you just look in human terms, uh, the oversimplified message here to me is crime doesn't pay. <laughs> Lying, stealing, murder, all of those things um, had a bad outcome for the offender. So crime doesn't pay. That, and that's totally apart from whatever God's message is. I think there's a human message here too, about greed. Yeah, and what, that, that's very good, Bill. And what kind of stories do we often hear that teach us about um, those kinds of things? About morals Aesop's or, what's that? Fables. fables, yeah, Aesop's fables are all about those kinds of things, right? So there's a, a really important um, body of literature in the Middle East that comes together in the medieval period that some of you have read um, called the Arabian Nights. <laughs> and I don't, well, if you haven't read the Arabian Nights, I, I highly encourage you to do so because they're wonderful. The Arabian Nights are all about these stories um, and many of them are about virtues and vices of living. And um, to me, this reads very similarly to one of the stories in the Arabian Nights. It has that same <clears throat> feel in terms of what is the message that's going on here. And the Arabian Nights, as we know, were stories that were oral in tradition, that were told around the campfires, for example, to teach lessons, much like Aesop's fables, and then they themselves were collected together in bodies of literature. And we know them because they came about and were translated in the 18th century um, and became very popular, um, you know, called the Arabian Nights. But originally they were all different kinds of stories meant to tell uh, tales about morals and ethics in life. So it's interesting to me that Jesus appears in a similar kind of genre uh, in the Islamic tradition, but to me it makes a lot of sense because um, while this body of literature is developing to teach people about how to live, it's also showing several characteristics of this particular person, this particular prophet, who is a wandering ascetic who can do miracles. So it demonstrates the power of this particular prophet. Now, I mentioned briefly to notice he says, by God's leave, whenever he does a miracle. Why is that important? He's not claiming, he's not claiming to have the same power as God. Or Exa yes, exactly. Exactly. So remember, in the Islamic tradition, Jesus is human. He's one of the prophets, one of the many prophets. And so here, for Muslims, they would say, yes, of course, Jesus does all kinds of miracles, but he always does it by virtue of asking God's permission for this to happen. And so there are several passages in the Gospel of John where Jesus prays to my father um, for particular, um, you know, uh, father, please hear me. Um, Muslims would latch on to that and say, this makes a lot of sense to us because it shows here is this human being who is um, praying to God the Father. Um, now, of course, Christians have a slightly different understanding because of our view of, of the Trinity. Um, but nevertheless, um, that's a, a, a particular moment of conversation or at least commonality that we might have about Jesus performing miracles. David, quick question. Do there are other... Yes. Do the other uh, Muslim prophets uh, do miracles as well? No, they don't. No, not all of them do miracles. Um, Jesus is noted primarily for his ability to do miracles and his ability to raise the dead, as we saw with the raising of the dough. Which brings me to the next story. Thank you, Dottie. You're welcome. <laughs> a, a prominent theme is there are a number of stories of Jesus raising the dead in a number of different ways, raising human beings to life. 
This is a very interesting story. It's a bit longer. I'll read the first paragraph, and then we'll continue. Who's next uh, in the list here? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'll start. It is related, and God knows best, that Jesus passed one day through a valley called the Valley of Resurrection and came upon a white skull from which the rest of the bones had decayed. Jesus admired its whiteness. The person had died 72 years previously. Jesus said, O oh God, I ask you, whom no eye can see, no doubts can confound, and no describer can describe, to, should be asked, to ask this skull to tell me to what nation it belonged. <clears throat> Next. Okay. God revealed to him, Jesus, speak to the skull and it shall answer you by my power, for I am powerful over all things. Jesus performed his ablutions, prayed to Raka, approached the skull and said, in the name of God, merciful and compassionate. All right, let me interrupt you right there. Thanks. Sorry about that. So what is this about ablutions and raka? Oh, we know ablutions, but I don't know raka. So a raka is the prostrations that Muslims do when they pray. Oh, okay. Right, you know, so when they go through the motions and I, then they bow I, down I, I, and put, put their forehead on the ground. Right now, but I'll, I'll call you back, okay? Bye. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, raka is the, the complete motion that Muslims do when they're praying, when they go through all the motions, put their hands on their knees, and then they bow their forehead on the ground, and then they come up and stand up. That's called a raka, the whole procession. So here in this case, Jesus performs the ablutions, he washes, and then he does two raka, two, um, two prayer motions um, before he does this miracle. So you can see for Muslims, this is, okay, this is a Muslim, right? Jesus is a Muslim. He's performing the prayers correctly, and this is uh, what, what one does. And then he says, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. What is that? How Muslims refer to Allah. Yeah, right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, right? The most, most prominent, most um, um, description of God that Muslims will use. In the name of God, the compassion, the merciful, and the compassionate. Okay, excellent. Let, sorry, there, go on. <laughs> With eloquent tongue, the skull answered, Spirit of God, you have called upon the best of names. Jesus said, I ask you in the name of Almighty God to tell me, where is your beauty and whiteness? Where is your flesh and fat, your bones and your soul? The skull replied, Spirit of God, as for beauty and whiteness, the earth has changed them. The flesh and fat have been consumed by the worms, the bones have decayed. As for the soul, it is today in hellfire, in great torment. Okay. So here is the skull telling Jesus what's going on with him lately, right? Now, what is this? What is this comment about spirit of God? What is that? Why does the skull call Jesus spirit of God? Uh, could he be God's spokesman, not God, but speaking for God? Yes. Remember in our first session that the Quran refers to Jesus in at least three different places as a spirit from God. Right? He's also called the word from God, right? So that term is used regularly throughout the Islamic tradition. Jesus is a spirit from God or of God, but in, in Islam, not the Holy Spirit, right? Or one person of the Trinity. So when we as Christians see that, that uh, term, we have to remember that Muslims are using it slightly differently and we can't assume that it means the same thing. And then it's on us to explain what we mean about spirit, the spirit of God. Okay, let's go on. Next paragraph. Jesus said, 
I ask you in the name of Almighty God, to which nation did you belong? The skull answered, I am from a nation upon which descended the anger of God in this worldly abode. Jesus asked, how did God's anger descend upon you in this worldly abode? The skull said, Spirit of God, God sent us a prophet who came with the truth, but we called him a liar. Mm. Wow. Mm. He commanded us to obey God, but we disobeyed him. God then caused, then caused rain and lightning to fall upon us for seven years, seven months, and seven days. There's that number seven. Mm -hmm. Then one day angels of torment descended upon us. Each nation, excuse me, each angel carried two whips, a whip of iron and a whip of fire. The angel, angel did not cease to extract my soul from joint to joint and from vein to vein until my soul reached my throat. Jeez. At that point, the angel of death stretched forth his hand and, wow, pulled out my soul. Jeez. What? What's, going on? What's going on here? Look, it, it looks like a dementor, right? If you've ever seen Harry Potter, kind of sucking the soul out from... That's, that's kind of how I, I view it. Yeah. <laughs> right. David, David yes. it, they, he also mentions hell. So they believe in hell. Oh, yes, absolutely. You'll see even more of this as we go on in this particular story. Yes. So what is, um, in this paragraph, um, the, the skull is talking about a prophet who was sent to his people. Now remember, as we mentioned in the first session, that in the Islamic tradition, there are all kinds of prophets. According to one tradition, 144,000 prophets that were sent to different peoples throughout time and uh, to bring them to worship one God and to warn them about the judgment day. So here's an example of one of those prophets that came to an unknown people, unknown community, and, and warned them about to worship only one God and that there would be a judgment day. And in this case, the community didn't fare very well. They didn't heed the call. So it's a lot like Jonah, you know, the story of Jonah, right? Going to Nineveh. In that case, the Ninevites repented and they weren't consumed in fire but in this case we find that the community was weighed laced was weighed laced laid waste and the only thing left was the skull right so it's interesting all right there's a few more um very graphic things to come here so let's go on that'll be interesting next paragraph jesus said i ask you in the name of almighty god describe to me the angel of death the skull answered, Spirit of God, he has one hand in the west, the other in the east. His head reaches up to the highest heavens, his legs reach down to the regions of the seventh and lowest earth. The earth itself is between his knees, all creation is between his eyes. The skull continued, O prophet of God, hardly an hour has passed when two pitch black angels came to me. They spoke like crashing thunder, and their eyes flashed like lightning. They were curly-haired and furrowed the ground with their fangs. They said to me, Who is your God? Who is your prophet? Who is your imam? Spirit of God, I was terrified, and I said, I have no God. Uh, no prophet, no imam except God. You lie, they said. Enemy of God and of yourself. They struck me a blow with a rod of iron so hard that I felt my bones had broken and my flesh had been torn away. They then cast me in the pit of hell and there tormented me for such a time as pleased God. While I was in this state, there came to me two guardian scribes who inscribed the deeds of all creatures in this world and they said to me, enemy of God, come with us to the, to the stations of the people of paradise. Okay. So here is the description of this person being tormented in hell, right? And then, um, for some reason, we don't know why, two angels come and tell him that they're going to show him paradise. Kind of like um, a Christmas carol, if you will, right? <laughs> there are the, the ghosts of Christmas past coming to, to walk him through life. Anyway, what follows 
is, and I, I haven't listed, I didn't include this here because it would be even several more pages of very graphic <clears throat> rated R material about what happens in hell. But this kind of literature is very common in both Islamic and Eastern Christian literature in the medieval period in descriptions of hell. Now, some of you may remember reading um, um, the famous, um, uh, now the name escapes me, um, Dante's Inferno. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Now, Dante's Inferno is a very long um, story or, or poem, but it's only part of Dante's work in which he does both heaven and then hell, the seven layers of hell. Yeah, Sarah's nodding. I know she's read this because she has her background in literature. So, yeah. So you can imagine here Dante's Inferno. Dante got a lot of his material uh, in the medieval period from all this, all these stories that were floating around in um, popular um, oral tradition about uh, what heaven was like and what hell was like. Now, we as Protestants don't really have that because uh, those are extra biblical literature. But there is one story in the Gospels, at least one story, where we see a person in hell or in Hades. Do you remember what story that is? Lazarus. Yeah. Yes. So I put that down at the bottom there. Luke 16, 19 to 31. So I'm going to read this last paragraph. And if somebody can find Luke 16, and we'll read that in a minute. Jesus then said to the skull, O oh skull, if you desire, ask anything of me by God's leave. The skull said, Spirit of God, pray that God would restore me to earthly life. Jesus then prayed to God, who resurrected the skull and handed it over to Jesus, whole and sound, through the power of Almighty God. She then remained 12 years worshiping God with Jesus until certitude, that is to say, death came upon her. She died a true believer, and God in his mercy placed her among the people of paradise. Hmm. All ends well. <laughs> right. Somebody read Luke 16, 19 to 31. Your jazz can take her turn. Do you see, do you see where I got to my feet? Do you see it? Okay, just a second. Okay. On your left. Yeah. 19. Rich man. Okay. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and sent Lazarus to dip the t tip of his finger in water and cool my, cool my tongue. I'm in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus in like manner, manner evil things, but now he's com comforted here and you are in agony. Beside all this, between us and the great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then, Father, I beg you, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that may he, he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father, Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Okay. So here Jesus is telling a story about Hades or hell and its torments. 
So Jesus himself was aware of these particular tradition in Jewish literature or oral, oral tradition about the afterworld, which we don't really hear a lot about um, in, in the New Testament until we get to um, uh, um, to Revelation. Um, what do you find striking or similar, or what do you find different in the themes between this passage or story from the Islamic tradition and the story that Jesus tells about Lazarus in Hades? What is similar? Let's say, let's start there. You mean what's similar about Hades? Well, just about the two stories. When you put them side by side, their themes or their purposes or their ideas. Well, that there'll be retribution for how you conduct your life when you're alive. Or there will be glory and, and comfort and praise and ever after. Mm -hmm. There is a judgment, right? There is a judgment. What else? Similarly, both people are dead. Hmm. As will we all. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. There, and, and here, Jesus or Abraham are talking to the dead. It's interesting. The description in um, the Bible is pretty concise, but in the other, it goes on and on and on and on and on about the twin. Yes, that's an excellent uh, observation. And remember what I said at the very beginning of the, of the class, that any time a story gets more detailed and extrapolates, there's a very good chance it was written much later. Why is that? Because people want to know more information. People want to know what if, or what did happen, or what did that look like, or what did it feel like? And... Others have provided those kinds of stories that get into the minutia of these particular biblical traditions. So there is, a, uh, I noted here, next to the reference to Luke, see also the Apocalypse of Peter. There's a very interesting early Christian extra biblical uh, piece of literature called the Apocalypse of Peter, in which Peter is shown uh, the afterworld. And it's a very graphic, detailed um, depiction of what happens to certain people in hell. Um, now, there's a good reason it didn't make it into the New Testament. But nevertheless, that particular um, uh, body of literature was read by Christians, and its stories are still read by Christians today. Uh, maybe not Lutherans in, in this particular uh, circle. Of Christians, but uh, nevertheless, there are people who do read these kinds of stories, and you will find paintings of these throughout Orthodox and Catholic communities, oh, yeah. especially in the Renaissance period, in the paintings we find in the Vatican. You will see the Judgment Day and what happens to people at the Judgment Day. Now, I want one last thing I want to mention, and then we'll then we'll I'll ask you about the differences. In both cases, you have Jesus talking to this dead person, and in in the other case, in Luke, Abraham talking to this dead person. Now, from the Islamic perspective, what is important about that? They're both prophets. They're both prophets, exactly. So, for Muslims reading this. There would be no problem whatsoever with the fact that here is Jesus um, talking to a dead person, raising a dead person, and finding out about the story of why they were dead and didn't heed the word of God that was coming to them to warn them of the judgment day. Okay. Now, the last thing that's very common about them that Lutherans definitely don't focus on, and that is punishment and death and punishment, right? Well, I suppose we are in Lent, so um, we, do, we do talk a lot about repentance, but we don't, it seems to me in this literature 
we hear the the terrible stories about what could happen to you if you were bad and therefore you should be good right it's almost kind of a scare tactic oh yeah Big scared straight right you're scared straight which for the most part lutherans don't usually focus on we focus on what grace grace forgive grace god's grace and love for us rather than the fear Although, something I will send you home with to ponder, remember, in Luther's small catechism, every particular um, commandment that he opens with is, we are to what? Love, honor, and obey. obey. We are to fear and love God. That's God, it. Yeah. Fear. Fear, and love. fear and love God. So that's an interesting thing for us to think about why Luther talks about fear and love God at the same time. All right, let's go to our last story and continue reading. I think, Nelson, you're next. Okay. Jesus set out to visit a brother of his. He was met by a man who said to him, Your brother has died. So Jesus turned back. When the daughters of his brother heard that Jesus had turned back, they came to him and said, Prophet of God, your turning back from us is harder to bear than the death of our father. He said, go forth and show me his grave. Okay. We're setting the story up here of the death of a person who has already died, but they approached the prophet to see what he could do. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Story of Lazarus and his sister. Yes, Sarah, go on. They went forth until they showed Jesus his grave. He, Jesus, called out to him, the dead man, in a loud voice. And the dead man appeared, his hair having turned gray. Jesus asked, Are you not so-and-so, my brother? Yes, the man replied. Okay, so how is the man described here? Old, having turned gray. Having His hair having turned gray. Now, this is interesting. I mean, why do you think, why is that? Why would the person's hair be gray? He took one look at hell, he turned gray. Exactly. He got scared to death. <laughs> His hair his hair stood on end and got gray, right? <laughs> exactly. So let's read the last paragraph. And what is it that I see has happened to you? I heard your voice and imagined it to be the great scream of judgment mm. day, the man replied. All the while, the man's wife saw and heard what Jesus had done. She said, blessed is the belly that carried you and the breasts from which you fed. Jesus said, blessed is he whom God has taught his book and who dies without becoming, having become haughty. <laughs> okay. So... This one here sounds to me an awful lot like the raising of Lazarus from John 11. John 11, 1 to 44, where Jesus is um, asked to come to visit and heal his friend Lazarus. And on the way, he finds out Lazarus has died. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing because it's quite a long narrative. But do you remember what happens to Jesus when he gets to the tomb of Lazarus? What does he do? He cries, he cries, he weeps. He weeps, he weeps. And why does Jesus weep? Because, because people didn't sad. believe that he could do what he could do. He loves his friend. He loves his friend. He loves his friend. His friend has died. Lazarus has died. Right. Do you see that? kind of emotion in the one from the Islamic tradition? No, no it's, it's more a matter of fact point about the judgment day. This person has died. They did not heed the call. They should have followed the prophet's warning and worshiped the one God. And there is a judgment day that all of us will face. So here, I think, is a distinctive marker and difference 
between the two traditions, the religious traditions. Here in the Gospel of John, we have Jesus as a human person with feelings and emotions who weeps, who weeps. And at the same time for us is not just a human being or not just a prophet, but a very window into the very feelings and essence of who and what God is. There is that passion of Jesus that is distinct, I think, in our tradition, that not that Jesus is not passionate or compassionate in the Islamic tradition, but that for us, it signifies God's very essence itself, which definitely is, is something that is different. So once again, we go back to the question about how do we as Christians think about Jesus as both a human being and as the essence of God? That is a tricky one, which we've been trying to figure out for generations, right? And how do we then describe that? Usually, the best way, I think, is through art, song, prayer, and worship. Those are not normally simply mental ascents or uh, rational rationalizations, but they involve our whole being, our whole body, our whole thinking, um, our spirit, soul, and mind. That's something that goes beyond what we can rationally uh, articulate. All right, any final thoughts you might have about these particular stories about the miracles of Jesus? Well, one thing that struck me in the middle story is that the skull was a female. Yeah. I don't know what to make of that, but it just, it, it's, I, I noted it. <laughs> right. And it's kind of nice. I mean, you know. For a change, yeah. For a change, yeah. I was struck by the, the dark angels. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can find many, many books uh, about what happens to people when they die and the um, process by which the angels of death come and then interrogate each person who's died uh, about their life and about what they believe and then um, whether they uh, are a true believer or not whether they go, you know, to torment or whether they go into paradise. And the angels of death are described in great detail. We get some of that here in this story. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I'm conscious of the time because we're accepting new members, and some of them are right here. <laughs> um, so may I say thank you on behalf of everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also say we will see you again. Please. Yes. Hopefully in person. Oh, hopefully in person. Yes. God's blessing. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Hey, Vicki. Nice to have you join us, Vicki. Sally and Sandy and Ruth and Jim and Karen. Diane, thank you all. Thank you so much. Okay.